Money Sense, bringing an informed financial perspective to the Cayman community. A very good morning and warm welcome to Money Sense. Your hosts this morning are Christoph Barnett, Neville Hicks, and myself, Simon Cordry. Good morning, gents. Good morning. Good morning. Today's show is dedicated to discussing the recently introduced pension legislation. There have been a number of changes that have been introduced, some of them slightly controversial, some of them welcome, some of them not by some members of the community. And so we'll be delighted this morning to be joined by two people, the Honourable Tara Rivers, who is the Minister of Education, Employment and Gender Affairs. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. And also by Ms. Amy Wollaston, who is the Superintendent of Pensions and Deputy Director of Pensions. Good morning. Good morning to you as well. Thank you both for joining us. Obviously, there have been some changes that have been introduced by law as of the beginning of this year. Perhaps you could just help us understand exactly what those changes are then. Well, there are some there, there are a f- number of changes, the five key ones that I think people need to be aware of right now that will affect what happens in the pension regime right now and then over the course of the several months and when regulations come into force as well, there will be additional changes that come into force. But I'll ask AIM to take us through what those key changes are at this stage. So on the 1st of January, so this has already happened, given our date today. This year, yeah. Yeah, so this year, thank you. On the 1st of January, the normal age of pension entitlement, which basically means the age when you are able to access, increased from 60, which it is under the 2012 version of the law, to 65 under the amendment. In addition, we've also um, increased the year's maximum pensionable earnings, All that is, is the amount on which you need to pay pension contributions. And that was $60,000 and is now increased to $87,000. So instead of paying 10% on $60,000, you're paying 10% on $87,000. Those have already come into effect. Um, Some key things that are coming into effect include um, on the 1st of February, collaboration between our office and other government departments that helps with issues of compliance. Also, um, some key changes for employers. On March 1st, the definition of employee actually changes so that Caymanians who are under the age of 23 and in full-time education are no longer required to pay pension contributions, neither the employee nor the employer. Also, another critical change on the 1st of March is the requirement for employers to maintain records, which is something... You know, most employers probably already do, but the Mm -hmm. law didn't actually dictate or stipulate what those records needed to be. So we've actually included that in the uh, amendments to the law this time. And those records need to be kept for five years. So I think all of those are very important in order for people to understand those things are coming into effect. Something that comes into effect a little later is access to additional voluntary contributions. That comes into effect in March of this year, at the end of March, actually. And under the law... Presently, you can't access your additional voluntary contributions, commonly known as ABCs, until a person reaches retirement age. But in in the amendment, which comes into effect on the 31st of March, you'll be able to access your ABCs prior to retirement under four very specific categories, housing, medical purposes, temporary unemployment, and educational. So those are some key things that are changing. Okay. Well, let's go back a step and let's just look at what has been changed as of today. We're in January, and it's happened as of the 1st of January. Two that you mentioned there, the increase in the pensionable age from 60 to 65 and the increase in the maximum pensionable amount that has to be um, paid by employers from 60,000 to 80,000. Perhaps you could just talk to us philosophically about why those changes were made because people look at that and say, well, it's important to understand why those changes are made in order to actually have a debate about whether it's the sense of the sensibility of those. Perhaps you could just help us out in the philosoph- philosoph- philosophy of it. Pardon me. Sh- sure. Um, the the fact is, Simon, we are living longer. The statistics show that. The data show that. We therefore need to make plans for longer life expectancy. And so many of us uh, not just have the need, but also the desire to continue to work longer to be able to put money aside for when you want to enjoy your golden years, so to speak. And we know those golden years are increasing. I think the average uh, life expectancy is 83 years old in the Mm -hmm. Cayman Islands, which is actually above the kind of global um, average. So having the um, what was deemed to be in the law at the time, the retirement age at 60, was kind of out of step with where the world was going as it relates to um, age of pension entitlement. Uh, So there is a definitional change as well, which is important because it makes it clear that there is no mandatory retirement age in the country, but instead it is an elective process if persons decide, well, you know what, I have worked to 65 and I would now like to 
you know, no longer stay in the active labor force at age 65 is what the age that we've raised that age to, given the fact that people, as I said, on average are living longer and need to make provisions longer. So by raising the age, you you increase the number of years that people actually save towards their retirement. um, And you actually allow persons to stay and contribute in the labor force as well because of the the previous law um, in many instances were used in ways to um, actually Mm -hmm. have people exit the uh, the workforce prior to even maybe... Well, um, well, let me me ask you about that in some more detail because I want to try and understand the mechanics of that. If someone under the previous law was approaching the age of 60 and they, they turned 60, was it the case that they might actually be forced to leave their job because they had reached the age 60? Whereas now, as with the change in the, in the wording of the law, it simply says that's the age you're entitled to now receive your pension. You can't receive it before, but you can continue working until you're 70 or 75 if you want to, if you and the employer both agree. Is that the subtlety of the change that you're talking about? Correct. The commencement order as it relates to the age of pension entitlement takes into account Another subtlety, uh, and it's important to raise that too, because people that may have been reach, um, approaching the age of 60, um, say anyone that is 48 and above by 1st of January 2017, um, still has the option to have the early retirement okay. uh, at 50 and age of pension entitlement at 60, which is under the, under the 2011 sure. revision, right. uh, to, um, because of the fact that we don't want to disenfranchise those persons who might have been thinking about retirement and putting yeah. things in place, either early retirement or regular well, retirement. Um, so anybody that's 47 or below at the age of, um, at, as of the 1st of January this year, the new pension regime as it relates to the pension entitlement being 65 applies to those persons. Okay. So, But to your point, it is certainly the um, intention of that legislative change and that definitional change to ensure that people understand that um, as you said, the, the you know employment is primarily a matter of contract law between employer mm-hmm. and employee, but there is no legislated, mandated age of retirement um, from the government's perspective. Uh, so, if people are able, willing, and, and 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 you know that agreement is reached, they can work beyond sixty five, mm-hmm. as is the case now. Um, but it's the point about. You know, given that the expectancy is that much higher, um, pension entitlement then should also reflect the fact that people are living longer, people are working longer, and it allows them to save that much more for when they do retire. Well, I think that's an important point. There's some basic maths in here, isn't there, which is if the age at which the average person is going to live to is 83 and you retire at the age of 60, that's 23 years you're going to be living without potentially working if that's the choice you make. Now, the basic maths one has to do is say, well, I'm going to be working for perhaps 40 years. I save 10% of my salary for 40 years, divide that then by 23. And that becomes quite a small number if you're not careful, unless there's been substantial investment growth. Now you're saying, well, actually, I'm going to work till 65. So the number of years you're contributing increases, the number of years you're drawing down decreases. And so the amount you get each year should hopefully be a much more substantial number, allowing people to live more comfortably in retirement, presumably. Absolutely. And that is also tied to the increase in the year's maximum pensionable earnings mm-hmm. um, from 60 to 87,000, mm-hmm. both because a, it was actually recommended uh, in one of the, the reports that we drew on heavily as a government. That's the Mercer Report of 2007. So it's, it's an inflation-adjusted figure that we, um, we decided upon. But also, it's the complement to raising the pension entitlement age to also raising the year's maximum pension of earnings. And what that means is if you make up to $87,000 a year, you are pensionable on that full amount. Anything beyond $87,000 a year, you don't have to pay pensions, but there's nothing in the law that prevents you from making additional voluntary contributions. And then the additional voluntary contributions change is an important one because we want people to invest more in saving for their future. And so by um, changing it where you can actually access additional voluntary contributions in specific cases of need prior to reaching the age of pensionable in, uh, pension entitlement gives people the comfort to know that, yes, if I save for my retirement, but if I have an issue with education or issue with housing or issue with employment um, and, and or issue with health, I can then draw from my additional savings mm-hmm. uh, if and necessary. Currently, or, or as I said, before this provision, 
um, came into force or comes into force, there is no option to be able to actually draw from your additional voluntary contributions. Whatever is there is locked. And that was acting as a disincentive in some instances for people to actually put aside more because they were concerned about, well, what if I need to access it prior to? So the government was cognizant of that and wants to encourage more savings for um, retirement. So by making that change to the additional voluntary contributions should hopefully change behavior in that regard. And that's something that was also uh, recommended um, in the Mercer report. Let me also add that um, I think we need to recognize as a country that our pension system is less than 20 years old. You mentioned earlier, when when you save for retirement, you're saving 30 and 40 years. And that's a key point because if you only save what you have in your pension, you're not going to have enough. People need to be making additional contributions or saving in some other mechanism if they don't want to put it in their pension plan so that they will have enough when it comes time to retirement. And I, I, th- I think just adding to that point before we get back to the, the, the voluntary contribution, but I think the, the beauty of it being young or the pension system here being young is that it allows you know government in conjunction with employees and employers to actually make the right decisions and allow it to grow in a way that is sustainable for yeah. the long term. I mean, we've seen... You know, there's a significant amount of pension plans that are heavily underfunded across the world right now. So hopefully, you know, we can learn and make decisions. And it's good to see some action taken uh, by government. Just getting back to the voluntary contribution. So, I mean, I, I think that's great if, it, if you know, 60, if there's certain reasons, you can now take it out. Let's take it to retirement now and say someone's been adding in additional voluntary contributions, do they have, what are their options as far as, um, you know, they're now at retirement and they're getting money out. What, how much money are they taking out on a monthly basis or annually basis? And is there options for them to actually uh, take out more, let's say, or take out uh, the voluntary contribution and use that for another investment? Well, when it comes to retirement, you really have two options of how to access your funds. You can either transfer the money held in your pension plan to an annuity, which is held by an insurance company, or you can transfer to a retirement savings arrangement, which basically is just a mechanism used to pay out the contributions to you or your benefit to you. We recently actually just undertook a very important project in which we reviewed the amount that is actually paid out on an annual basis. Um, it was previously set at $12,000, and it was indexed slightly over a period of time. But what we've done now is we did a, a very detailed study with Morno Chappelle, which are consultants out of Canada, mm-hmm. and we recognized that that amount needed to be reviewed and evaluated to make it more uh, appropriate for people. So with their assistance, we've ter- determined that the new amount, which actually took effect on the 9th of January, so earlier this month, is $12,480. So that might sound like a minor change to some people, but under the old schedule, first of all, it would take you three years to get $12,480. And second of all, the old schedule did not consider your age in any way, did not consider your account value in any way. The new schedule um, allows for the minimum threshold, which is the $12,480. That's the new amount. That's going to then be adjusted for inflation. In addition, it establishes a minimum and a maximum percentage. So we have the 12480 as the minimum threshold. Mm-hmm. So if you are a person who has a substantial amount of money in pensions, right, then you'll be able to access more of your money than the minimum threshold. That's the importance of a minimum and a maximum percentage. Okay. But if you're a person who doesn't necessarily have a substantial amount, then you know this is the minimum threshold, and then that threshold will increase with inflation. So I think that's a very important change that has been made. But going back to the, the question about accessing, so you can either access with annuity or with the RSA. So you have those two options. If when you get to retirement, you have made substantial additional voluntary contributions mm-hmm. under the new structure, you'll be able to access them under the four criteria. If you haven't accessed them under that criteria, then you'll be able to take them out as a lump sum in retirement, which is how it is now. Okay. We need to take a brief break. We've already gone through our first half of the show this morning. (laughs) Um, Please join us again in two minutes as we continue our conversation with Minister Rivers and Ms. Wollaston, Superintendent of Pensions, regarding the new changes to the pension legislation here on Ireland. 
Money Sense, the only personal finance radio show in the Cayman Islands, hosted by Simon Caudry from the CFA Society Cayman Islands. This is Money Sense. Welcome back. In the second half of today's show, we are going to continue our conversation with Minister Rivers and Ms. Wollaston regarding the pension landscape here in Cayman. Now, in the first half of the show, we talked in some detail about things that have recently changed. I think it's probably quite useful to try and clarify the pension industry and the pension legislation is complicated, right? There's a lot of things associated with it. So perhaps you can just help us out by understanding what has not changed right now and and then we can talk a little bit more about what's imminent and what's going to change. Okay, so I think I think um, again because of the length of the show, the amount of changes that have been that have been approved in the legislation, we will focus on of those changes that have been approved in the primary legislation, that is the amendment law of 2016. What has actually been included in the commencement order? So the dates that we know when certain provisions will in fact come into. Okay. So at that point, I mean, with, with that in mind, I'm going to ask Amy to talk about some of the other provisions that we know that will be coming into force and when those provisions will be coming into force okay. and what that impact Fabulous. is. Okay. Over to you, Amy. No problem. So two key changes that will be coming. So in December of this year, December 31st of this year, actually, the ability to um, make an overseas transfer, the criteria for that will actually change. So under the present law, the only requirement to make an overseas transfer is that your employment is terminated. That's all that's required. Mm -hmm. However, in the amendment, um, which as I said, comes into effect on December, in December of 2017, the requirement for transfers will be extended. So in addition to the termination of employment, there will be no contribution, there must be no contributions to your account for two years, and you must cease to reside in the island for two years. So that's quite a different um, way than it is currently. I'll let Minister talk about the policy behind that. That's an interesting one because it will affect a lot of people in different ways. People who previously were able to take their money overseas will now have to wait two years, if if I understand you correctly. And so people, whether rightly or wrongly, will have questions about that. So perhaps you could just talk to us through the philosophical policy reasons why that change was introduced. Again, I think it's because, especially given the nature of our... um, economy, given the nature of our workforce being very transient where people come and go, and they come and go often for various reasons, rollover, etc. Um, we wanted to ensure that the purpose and the intended purpose of pensions is is maintained, and that the fact is if persons are planning to be more permanent members of the community, but for whatever reason takes the breaks, um, you know, that there is some level of um, ability to do so. So the ability to transfer is still there, but it does now cause people to be more more planning is going to be in 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 um required in order to make the determinations as to when if i leave am i leaving for for good or am i leaving just for a break um so the 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 issue um and the reason why the commencement date is set a year out is to take into consideration that there are people that are working on island now who maybe having those considerations, employers as well as employees. So it gives people time to plan. If they want to be a more permanent member of the community, they know that in a year's time, this is going to be the law of the land that will apply to everyone. Um, But if you're here now, you're here now, you came here for a finite period of time, a, 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 a short period of time, or like I said, a finite period of time, you can then make the adjustments and the decisions within and the, and the arrangements. Employers can make arrangements with, with, with respect to um, their recruitment practices and their recruitment policies, etc. So it does take into consideration such, uh, a person's consideration currently, uh, giving them that year to plan, so to speak. But it also then, going forward, takes into consideration the fact that Pensions are for the intended purpose of being for pensions. And so you can transfer to another pension plan um, or, you know, analogous pension system overseas after the two-year period once you decide that you've left the jurisdiction and that is considered to be a reasonable time away. Well, no one, if I understand it correctly, no one's actually prejudiced in essence by this in the sense that someone who leaves the island will, after two years, have their pension pot transferred to a new pension provider somewhere else. If they elect to do so, yes. The detriment, in inverted commas, I use inverted commas around that, the detriment is that it has to stay on a 
Cayman Islands pension provider. And if someone is unhappy with the performance of that, that's the negative potentially. If they perform well, that's the positive. But they're not forced. The money doesn't sit there in a non-interest bearing account for two years waiting for them to transfer. It still stays as part of the pension system, right? That, that's correct. But let us also focus on the fact, and I, I didn't make this point when I started, the, the criteria I listed is only for an overseas transfer. So if you're unhappy with your current pension plan, then that's considered a local transfer, would not be subject to the criteria, criteria I listed. But then you can just exercise the option of moving from one pension plan to another. Okay. And so that, and option, that option and, always exists. Okay. And, and I, I guess, let me just take a step back. Maybe maybe this is a, a, a silly question, but if if you have under the current law, as it stands right now, um, if if you had you know someone here who'd contributed and then left island, what do they? Does the transfer have to go into another registered pension plan, or do they have the ability to take that cash directly? Okay, so there's two different things, which is the next thing I was going to talk about. Okay. So that's a good segue. So there's two things. There's a transfer which for clarity means that your entire balance, whatever that is, is basically moved from your current pension plan to another pension or an analogous product overseas. Mm -hmm. And it needs to move into a retirement type product. It can't move into your savings account. That's a transfer. But a refund, which is a completely different thing, a refund means that you get your entire balance back in a lump sum to you personally, not to a pension plan, but to you personally. And that's the difference between the terms. I know some people get them confused, so I'm glad you brought that up so we can clarify that. Under what circumstances then is someone entitled to a refund? Okay, so under the current law, as it is now, you would be able to get a refund when your employment is terminated, you've had no contributions to your account for two years, and you've ceased to reside on the island for six months. That's how it is now. Mm -hmm. So the amendment to the law, which actually comes into effect in December of 2019, with respect to refunds, will remove the ability to get a refund altogether. Mm -hmm. That will not exist. In order to get a refund prior to then, you need to have ceased your contributions by December of 2017 of this year. That way you okay. would cry, you would meet the two-year meet the two year requirement that exists. Why, and why wait until December 2019 to eliminate the refund? Why not just eliminate that today? For the same reason yeah. that I discussed from the transfer provision, we want to give people time to get their affairs in order okay. to make whatever decisions they want to make to make long-term plans about where they want to be, um, you know, resident, working, mm-hmm. living, making their their home so to speak so it's it's to give both employers as and employees that ability to make those decisions in a reasonable period of time so that's why a year mm-hmm. for sure. our, to, you know was given in, in essence it comes into effect on 2019 but the contributions would have to stop by the end of this year december 31st meaning you would have to terminate okay. your employment so again we didn't want to um as a government be unreasonable and bring that change into force immediately without giving ch- people that ability to make those plans that they may have for their life the reason why we felt it was important to make the change at all is because this idea of a refund for pensions is very much an anomaly it is not something that we are aware of that ha- exists in any other um, pension jurisdiction, mm-hmm. and what it it does is it it, it um, lessens the ability for potential abuses of the um, pension fund in the sense that pension, going back to the primary purpose of pension, is to save for your retirement, save for when you're no longer in the workforce. Um, you know, hopefully by choice, uh, and and certainly it allows you then to be able to live comfortably um, as an income replacement. But this situation of a refund, um, there were a number of cases that the department has dealt with over the years that um, the the, the spirit and the purpose and the essence of pensions were not being carried out because of that um, ability in in, in the law. And I've heard people who have said to me, well, I'm leaving the island. Why do you care as to what I do with my pension money and if I take it all out and spend it on on a yacht or spend it on a car? (laughs) And, and, And it's true. The island, in that sense, shouldn't care if you leave the country. But it's an incredibly naive and short-sighted view of that person because unless that person knows they're going to die at the age of 65, <laughs> they're going to need some saving somewhere else in the future. So it, from, a, from a purely financial and economic perspective, everybody should be thinking – and it's very difficult to think about pensions of because course, they're things that don't term. happen until you mm-hmm. – well, hopefully a while away. 
although we all seem to be getting closer to that date, and it, it worries me a little bit as we the grey hairs form. But it is something that people need to think about much more seriously, about the essence of what a pension is for. The idea that ever there would be a refund implies that you're never going to be not you're never going to be a pensioner, which of course is almost improbable unless something catastrophic happens. So I think that's a very positive development. I, I recognise, I, I, I accept that two years you give people the chance to mm. see the ev- evolution of the law and, re- and change it, but I, I, I do think that's a very positive step. Well, thank you, and yeah. I think, uh, just to your point about, I, again, from the kind of government perspective and going back to the point I made about having, being a, having a very transient work um, uh, force where people often come and go um, for, you know, short breaks, even when you leave the jurisdiction, doesn't necessarily mean that you've left the jurisdiction, if you know what I mean. So we want to make sure that, you know, you mm-hmm. you are planning for if you ever were to return to the jurisdiction, as you said, you hopefully don't experience a catastrophic situation and you're able to retire and experience your golden years. So that is some of the considerations that we had in mind as well. But certainly um, there, are, there are provisions in the law um, that allows for if you... Uh, once you reach the age of pension entitlement, and if you were to then move overseas or have been overseas at that Certainly. point, and you want to access your pension funds, but you, there is no analogous pension system in the country that you're in, uh, and you don't want to just receive the pension payments from the Cayman Islands directly, which is also an option to do, because even if you move wherever in the world, you can still get your pension payouts from whatever provider locally here in the Cayman Islands, but for whatever reason, if you decide at that point, you reach pension entitlement, mm-hmm. you want the lump sum, that is possible uh, under the change that, the, that we've made as well, because if there is no analogous pension system that you can get that money at that mm-hmm. time, you are of pensionable age, it is your money, you definitely have the ability to then use it to live off of. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, we've got about uh, two minutes left in the show, which is nowhere remotely close enough to dwell on this next topic, which I want to ask you about. But it's important to talk about, so let's just try and do it ever so briefly. Compliance. It's still an issue on Ireland, right? People, there are still companies which aren't paying pensions when they should be. How big an issue is it? And, and, and will the changes that the law is making make your life as superintendent, for instance, easier to make this problem smaller? So tell me about what, how, how this is going to make your life easier, or, or if it will. Well, the... There are several changes in the legislation that will actually strengthen the legislation in order to deal with compliance. First of all, in um, February, on February 1st, actually, there's a significant increase in the fines that exist in legislation. So as we all know, the law came into effect in 1998. So basically in the past 18, 19 years now, the law has not been amended. None of the fines have been changed. So we have um, increased all of the fines. Actually, we've introduced some new fines as well. So that then allows the judiciary to award or make make awards in those issues more, more pertinent, more important. And then in addition to that, there's also the ability for departments to collaborate. So people criticize some departments for not for operating in silos, but this particular provision is meant to address that point. So that now our department will be able to collaborate with other departments like immigration, like trade and business or uh, Department of Commerce and Investment in order to deal with issues of employers not actually doing what they should be doing under the legislation. Let me also point out that recently the Office of the Complaints Commissioner actually issued certification to the ministry that the office had to, that the department sorry had complied with all of their requirements from the 2010 report. So I think that's a positive step for the department as well. So if somebody and that, sorry and that 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 um, verification by the the Office of the Complaints Commissioner came as a result of the fact that the government made the changes to the legislation in order to strengthen the department as as um, as well as sure. mm-hmm. so something uh, let me on, also touch on, on something else um, it hasn't come yet but it's things to come the introduction of administrative fines there are several other government departments who have that ability and we are seeking to introduce that as well which would allow for the department to more effectively and efficiently deal with issues of compliance we don't necessarily have to go through the court process which we recognize can be time consuming they have a heavy course, workload yeah. as well this now creates another opportunity for us to re- better enforce the legislation and if somebody has a concern that they've not been treated fairly by the employer they have, they approach you and say I've got a problem and you can help deal with it. Absolutely. Okay, All great. they need to do is file a complaint with our office. Great. Well, we are, I'm afraid, running out of time rapidly. So I'm afraid 
thank you both for joining us this morning. It's thank been you. a real pleasure, yeah. Minister and Superintendent. So thank, thank you, you both thank for you. joining us. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. As a final note then before we leave, I just want to remind all our listeners that today's show will be able to be heard as a podcast on the CFA Society Cayman Islands webpage. And encourage you, if you have a question or conversation that you want to make about the show, please email us at moneysense at candw.ky or tweet us at moneysense radio. With that, thank you once again. Goodbye, and please do tune in in two weeks' time. Money Sense is brought to you with the support of One Trade X. One Trade X, the Cayman Islands' number one choice for online brokerage.